Welcome students to Anthropology 325. Uh, this is the lecture on traditional Denina subsistence. I'm Alan Boris and I'm speaking to you from my office here at Kenai Peninsula College. So first of all an anthropological view of subsistence. We'll take a few slides here to just sort of orient ourselves to how anthropologists view subsistence and, uh, and then lead into Denina uh, subsistence. So we can say this is getting and distributing food energy. It's roughly coterminous with the economy, uh, but uh, usually re, uh, applies specifically to foods, getting foods, distributing foods. There's a general classification of subsistence strategies, uh, and it, it uh, comes out of the University of Michigan in the 50s and 60s, hunting and gathering societies, also called food foraging societies, pastoral, horticultural, agricultural, and uh, industrial agricultural societies. Uh, these uh, have increasing compl complexity. Complexity in not in the sense of what any one person knows, but complexity in terms of the number of institutions involved. So agricultural societies, for example, have more and varied institutions than pastoral societies, which in turn have more and varied institutions, uh, formal institutions than hunting and gathering societies. So complexity increases and generally tends to correlate with per capita energy consumption, both food-wise and otherwise energy-wise. Um, just to emphasize a point that uh, anthropologists do not view this as progress. Progressivity is not the issue. Often these are characterized in other writings as progress, getting better. Uh, it isn't necessarily getting better, it isn't necessarily getting worse, it's just different. Um, in terms of sustainability, however, you could easily argue that hunting and gathering societies are much more sustainable in the long run, certainly than industrial agricultural societies. I doubt if there's many people today that would look at the characteristics of the way things are going, the trajectory of the way things are going today, and say that we are on a sustainable course. Uh, in terms of Denina and other salmon cultures, it's also important to point out that because of the nature of salmon, the salmon cultures have many of the characteristics of a horticultural society. Horticultural meaning one that uh, essentially subsistence farming, growing their own foods, hunting some game, supplementing it with wild resources, but not, uh, not one based extensively on trade. Often these have clan-based systems which organize labor. Often they have some type of leader, uh, some position, formal position of leadership, but not to the extent of agricultural societies and civilizations and state systems and so on. Uh, salmon cultures have these characteristics, clan-based, organizing labor for catching, procuring, storing salmon. Geshka uh, we talked about among the Denaina as a leadership position. And the reason that salmon cultures have many of the characteristics of horticulture is that the salmon are a very secure food resource that um, only needs to be harvested at a spot and so many are sedentary or at least semi-sedentary and take on characteristics of horticultural societies. Hunting and gathering then is any type of subsistence in which a population size is limited by the carrying capacity of the natural environment. I will use natural here in contrast to uh, one based on domesticated plants and animals. So all of the other subsistence strategies uh, that we just mentioned have uh, one to one degree or another reliance on domesticated plants or animals. Hunting and gathering do not, therefore are limited by the carrying capacity of the natural environment. 
carrying capacity is the maximum population reflecting the total amount of food energy available to sustain a species, in this case humans, in a particular ecosystem. So we can speak of the carrying capacity for moose uh, in Cook Inlet. We can speak of the carrying capacity of any animal. We can also speak of the carrying capacity of humans who are living off the land. Um, in terms of human cultures, um, almost never do they reach 100% of carrying capacity. Uh, wherever there is data, wherever there's information, typically hunters and gatherers uh, achieved about 50% of carrying capacity, uh, and you would want that. If you're at 100% carrying capacity, you're in a very precarious position, and starvation or some other problems will inevitably result. 50% is typical. And we could add as a sidelight, our world system today is moving uh, pell-mell toward 100% of the carrying capacity of the world ecosystem and many of the problems today can be attributed to that. Back to hunting and gathering. Typically uh, uh, employ optimal foraging strategies. That's nothing more than situate yourself where the food is. Uh, minimize the effort to maximize your return. This is not sport hunting. This is subsistence hunting. And of course don't take any more than you need because you might need it later. We also can talk uh, a bit about the nutritional value of, hunting, of a hunting and gathering diet. So one view is that all humans have evolved to metabolize food similarly and have the same daily nutritional requirements. But there's some evidence to suggest this isn't exactly the case and that uh, nutritional requirements are affected by enculturation and, uh, and that is how you have, how your body has adapted to use foods and perhaps how the body and various cultures have evolved to use foods. It appears to take about 4,000 years for that type of evolution to occur and it means having a sustained diet of a similar type over those 4,000 years. So the human enzyme producing capacities may adapt long term. Uh, to adapt to metabolize meat such that plant foods are um, minimally necessary. So some evidence for that. The Chipwayan, the Canadian Athabascans, ate no plant foods, or at least the ethnographic literature indicates they ate no plant foods, even though they were available and uh, obviously survived. So if that data is true, if that ethnographic information is true, they must have adapted somehow to that feature. The Tichoni, also an Athabascan group in Canada, had a documented diet of 95% meat and fish, 4% carbohydrates mainly from berries, and only 1% starch from bear roots. Uh, this might be called the, the paleo diet, the so-called paleo diet, which if you do a Google on the internet, you will find quite a bit of information on the paleo diet. Some of it scholarly, a lot of it pr pushing a particular kind of sort of Atkins-like diet, heavy into meat and less into carbohydrates. The Yupik, uh, some work by the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, 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 researchers have uh, su has suggested that Yupik in southwest Alaska in the Kuskokwim area have evolved to metabolize salmon, producing high resistance to diabetes, depression, and possibly other diseases. Uh, this is a very interesting and pretty recent finding, and not surprising. Uh, the Yupik in that area, and the Denina for that matter, uh, in that area, have been um, relying on salmon for uh, 4,000 years enough time to adapt to it. Of course they aren't eating only salmon as we will point out here, but salmon being the keystone species, the primary species, and uh, have adapted to it. Many of the people, uh, elders you talk to say we need it. We need salmon. We have to have it. We can't have a diet without salmon. 
and it's expressing what scientists are now demonstrating. So uh, the take-home point is that it may be an error to assume that pre-contact denina, for example, had the same nutritional requirements as we um, acknowledge today. It, and there may be some degree of adaptation, both biological adaptation and short-term adaptation, biophysical adaptation, to uh, certain diets that uh, is still to be worked out. Settlement pattern then, just quickly. Um, uh, settlement pattern, uh, the distribution location of people within a territory uh, is determined by subsistence if you're a hunter and gatherer. And so we said at the very beginning of the class in one of the lectures that uh, uh, Canadian Athabascans in the, in the eastern part of Dene territory, uh, such as the uh, Chipewyan, but also in, Can in Alaska, the Han, the Gwich'in, were primarily nomadic, living in tents, following caribou, salmon being less important, semi-sedentary Koyukon, Tanana, other groups, uh, uh, some log houses indicating uh, near salmon streams, but also quite nomadic. And the Denina and Atna are uh, sedentary, or at least semi-sedentary, in most parts of their territory, living in those stout log houses, Nichils, that we talked about in the previous lecture, but also in temporary camps going out to harvest various foods. So semi-sedentary to sedentary, depending on territory, in the high uh, salmon areas, uh, streams, the, the Lake Clark area, Kenai, Kasilof River areas, the S lower Susitna areas, um, Tuitna, MacArthur River areas, these areas uh, would be primarily sedentary. So a little bit on, on what uh, has come to be called folk taxonomy. It's a version of, or a branch of, I should say, cognitive anthropology, how people think about their world and how people uh, organize their world. And this is called folk taxonomy, the organizations that were passed on from generation to generation as people perceived of their world. For the Denina, we know this from modern uh, interviews. We know it from origin stories. We know it from ethnographic literature. And we can roughly piece it together this way. So there were humans. And this is in the upper left. There were Denina. Um, <coughs> uh, Denina, uh, recall, meaning the people. Um, and the second category was dogs, Lika. So dogs uh, are a category unto themselves. They're not animals. They're not humans. They're animals that live with humans and assist humans in the hunt. But at the same time, they're not humans, but would have animate characteristics much like uh, humans. And indeed, all animals would be perceived of to be having a soul or a soul-like quality. Uh, at another equal level are the warm-blooded animals. Uh, and uh, here we'll insert the idea that the category is named by what is perceived to be by the people as the dominant species within that category. So warm-blooded animals are called gaga which is the same name for brown bear, gaga. So brown bear would be perceived to be the dominant animal within that category. And so the whole category is called that. And that includes both animals and birds. So um, brown bear is gaga as the dominant mammal. Of the birds, chagagashla is the dominant animal. You may think that in terms of birds that it would be raven or it would be eagle or some other of those raptors or dominant birds. But no, it's the humble little chick chickadee, the chagagashla. 
our little friend is what that, our little creature uh, is what that means. Um, and we might gain insight into that by the two categories of birds, the He Chagagashla and the Shan Chagagashla. The He Chagagashla are the winter birds, and Chickadee is that winter bird. It stays here year round. Uh, it seems to be everywhere in that northern boreal forest. You're out in the winter skiing or whatever you're doing, and there's that little chickadee dee dee chickadee calling you. The Shan Chagagashla are the summer birds, and they have two categories. I didn't put those on here. The Shan Chagagashla involve the birds that come and pass through, such as snow geese. So snow geese will come to various places in Cook Inlet on their way up from the west coast somewhere, I think California, Oregon area. Pass through, stop and feed, and then move on to their summer grounds. Whereas uh, Nutaki, the Canadian geese, they come and they stay, but then they go back again. So the real bird <laughs> is the hay chigaga of the hay chigagashla is the chickadee and there's a bit of an analogy to people here most of you listening to this are uh, winter birds here stay here year round and some people come in the summer and they pass through tourists and some come and just live for the summer and these snowbirds then go back home so not surprising that the Denina would perceive of the chickadee as the dominant bird. Trees then are called chihuahua. Chihuahua uh, is the spruce, so spruce is the tree of trees. And so we'll talk later about categories of plants, particularly edible plants. But uh, trees would be, or plants would be named after chihuahua, the tree of trees. Insects, uh, this you could probably guess, is the mosquito. Tsich, tsich, the mosquito, uh, which is everywhere in the summer. Enough about that. And then the fish, uh, fluka, the salmon. And, of course, it was recognized many types of salmon and many other uh, uh, fish as well. And, again, we'll talk about that. But the category fish is named after the dominant species, and not surprising, that is the salmon. So here I have a slide showing the major bird classifications, someone's little creature, the Chigagashla, the winter birds, the summer birds, and then the two categories, the migratory birds that stay all summer and the migratory, migratory birds that pass on through. Let's talk then about traditional Denina subsistence uh, as it would have occurred before European contact but well into European contact. Uh, I'll categorize this as fish, land animals, sea mammals, birds, and plant foods. Um, and let, and should admit at the outset say there was a good deal of variation within Denina territory as to the relative importance of these various categories. In general, a maritime adaptation was most important in Kachemak Bay, southern end of Denina Territory, and then progressively less important further north. Uh, in, conversely, land animal adaptation was more important in inland areas, less important toward Kachemak Bay, which had a distinctly more marine adaptation. Kachemak Bay, we could also say, however, is at the margins of Denina Territory and is somewhat atypical. Uh, closest thing to it would be some of the bays, Texidney Bay and so on, on the far side of, uh, on the west side of Cook Inlet. So there's a great deal of variation uh, within uh, Denina Territory. Uh, and it's hard to characterize that. I think it still needs to be sort of um, uh, analyzed further and spelled out. Um, salmon is everywhere important, but not everywhere equally important. Very important in the Quijack drainage, meaning Lake Clark, Mulchatna, Iliamna area. Very important in the Kenai Peninsula uh, with the Kenai Kasilov areas. On the 
west side of Cook Inlet, the Chewitna and MacArthur rivers, and in, in, in parts of the Susitna drainage, salmon is very important. But there would have been places where um, uh, Denina occurred in inland areas where they're at the sort of the far reach of where salmon uh, migrate into. And as you know, they lose nutritional capacity the further they go up into the rivers, getting redder and redder before they spawn. And so in those areas, very likely land mammals were um, far more um, important. So bear in mind that there is variation. We're not saying it's one culture everywhere equally uh, dependent on the same resources. So what I've got is my handy dandy scale of importance of foods. So uh, I'm gonna, we're going to go through a list of subsistence foods uh, adapted from Cornelius Osgood's book. You have that book in your reading packet. Uh, he has a list there of species that were important as he interviewed elders in the 1930s. Um, but he's just got a list. So what I've attempted to do is give it a, a scale, a list of very important to least important, one to five. So five is very important, meaning it's abundant, concentrated, or of high nutrient value. Salmon is, is a five. Um, and on down to least important, that means they're not very abundant or they're not concentrated, meaning you have to expend a lot of energy to get them, or they have low nutritional value. Mushrooms, for example, they might taste good, but they have a low nutritional value and little return for the, for the effort. So uh, bear in mind, this is subjective. It's kind of my own experience and understanding. Uh, I don't want you to think there's, uh, you, you can certainly challenge the numbers. Oh, I think that should be a two instead of a three, or vice versa. Uh, but I just want to give you a sense for how important these various um, foods are for the people. So we'll start with salmon and fish and five species as you know the Sluka being the Denina name and I've got five, I've got five plus here actually because salmon uh, that's the keystone species uh, for the Denina and uh, for the other salmon cultures. And then uh, I've also got the list of techniques for how those uh, salmon in this case were taken. And uh, so we've got V-shaped weirs, basket weirs, beach set nets, drag nets also. I don't have an illustration of that coming up, but simply taking a net and dragging it through the water. Uh, in some cases, a spear with a barbed point. And uh, I want to talk uh, just a bit about the first salmon ceremony. Um, so let's, uh, let me go to the slide, uh, the technique slide here. So these are some of the techniques. You've seen this slide in the upper left before. Um, that, uh, Ill, that was done, uh, that was done by Bill Thomas, who was a student, and he researched Osgood's book and others. Osgood has this illustration here, uh, where he's got the weir uh, drawn this way, and then this sort of triangle affair here. And of course, the fish come this way, and the current goes that way, and uh, the fish are caught. So he 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 drew this. He's a he was a very good artist, and drew this uh, illustration of how they might have been fishing. And uh, it's a classic one, and uh, he didn't put the little gate in here, but somehow when they weren't fishing, they'd open up a gate, and the fish would, of course, swim on through, and escapement would occur, and you wouldn't be fishing out your stream. Very efficient um, method of salmon fishing and in this case targeting the um, um, silver salmon or coho salmon who who go up uh, side channels or go up uh, small creeks tributary to the larger rivers and we talked about that when we talked about archaeology 
Another way were these fish tra or basket traps, pardon me. These were long, 12 feet long in some cases, uh, made of these poles bound together. The, this is a side view, but it would also it would be sort of oblong or circular. And would have this pole arrangement here. So the fish, once they got in, they wouldn't get out again. And there'd be a little opening where you could pick out the fish. Uh, I'm quite sure that these were not used where there were heavy runs. Uh, that would fill up pretty fast, so to speak, and uh, and and you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't use those in places where there's a heavy heavy run of fish. The 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 weir, the fishing weir illustrated over here, would be the technique you'd want to use there. But this would be a place you put it in the water, you leave it, you go away, and you. You um, you do other things, hunt or whatever, come back at the, at the end of the day or a couple of days, and there's your fish ready to go. All of these are going to imply minimizing effort and maximizing return. This style does not mean a corporate kin group is not, is needed. This style does mean a corporate kin group is needed because there's a lot of work to building the building the weir. You'd have to rebuild it every uh, spring after because of the ice, uh, digging the, the cold storage pits pr and processing the fish and so on. This too would be uh, energy uh, labor intensive and probably f clan based. Um, so this is an illustration from Elliot. Uh, Elliot was here around 1900. I can't remember the exact years he was here. Uh, he was an American official that was uh, surveying for, I can't remember what he was surveying for, but uh, he, uh, as the course of what he was looking at, uh, he described the Denina and we're thankful that he did. So this is a weir that would be found on the coast, for example, possibly in a larger lake, but in the coast, um, uh, fish run just offshore in some cases, particularly as they're heading for their natal stream. And so this is another type of sort of weir type operation built out like this. And uh, the fish are diverted. So here they're coming. The fish are coming and they're diverted out. And here's a guy with his spear or dip net probably dipping out the fish, bringing them back in. Um, it's also possible that they had some kind of uh, net mesh similar to set net fishing, but uh, I'm guessing with all the logs and other kind of junk in the, that floats up and down in the inlet that that was not too efficient. So dip net fishing out here, bringing the fish in to be processed. Um, this is probably the style of fishing at, say, Kalifornski Village. Later you're going to see a video a virtual field trip to California Ski Village, and um, this is a type of type of fishing that would have been done on the coast. So up and down Cook Inlet, as the fish came in, they would be using these type of weirs. So salmon are important, uh, and the the people had a, a a ceremony and a story that uh, signifies that importance. And I'll tell you the short version. The complete version is in Osgood's book. Uh, it's called The First Salmon Ceremony. And so the traditional story goes like this. Uh, there was a young, uh, a young girl who um, uh, was told by her parents and her elders not to go near the fish weir. So it would have been a weir similar to um, the weir here in the upper left. Don't go near the fish weir. Um, but she was a headstrong girl, and she did. <coughs> so uh, she uh, and she slips into the water, and her parents and the villagers are naturally distraught. They look for her everywhere. They can't find her. And finally, after long and uh, arduous search, they they give up. They just they can't find her. 
a number of years later, uh, her uncle is at the fish weir and is picking out some fish that have been caught. And he lays them on the ground, on the grass, and he then takes them up to the village. But he goes back, he forgot a little one. And it, when he goes back, he sees in the face of the little salmon his nephew. His nephew. His nephew who has returned. The daughter has spawned the salmon. The people and the salmon are one. The people are and are the salmon. The Denina are the salmon people. And so the, the story is meant to uh, reflect, I think, that connection. You cannot take the people away from the salmon or the salmon away from the people. It's very interesting that um, that then became the first salmon ceremony. So there was a ceremony that was held each year with the return of the salmon, which sort of was loosely based on the story where the fish are, are first laid out on the grass. And then they are butchered and shared among the people. And it would be considered to be a world renewal ceremony. The world is good again. The salmon have returned. We will survive. We will thrive. Uh, the world is good and would be practiced each year with the return of the salmon. And you might imagine how important that event would be. Even today in Cook Inlet, uh, you'll hear when the first kings start coming in, the, the kings are in. You'll hear it on the radio. You'll hear it um, maybe, you know, around the, around the, the coffee pot at work. Yeah, the kings are in. And in previous times, even more important. A version of that ceremony is still practiced today in many parts of Denina territory, where the first king that is caught, or the first salmon that is caught in the spring, is shared among the people. It's, it's um, butchered and cooked and shared among the people, especially among the elders, especially the elders who uh, who appreciate it so much. A world renewal ceremony saying uh, our world is good. We will, we, will, we will continue to thrive as Denina people. But there are other fish that were important. Uh, remember here's my, uh, my little scale here of relative importance. Halibut Halibut were taken by intertidal hook and line fishing, and I'll show you an illustration of that, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, candlefish, or hooligan, are very important. They will precede the salmon in the spring um, and, uh, and, and become the first fresh fish of the spring, very oily by modern standards, but very important nutritionally and in volume wise so two to three maybe three more than two here we'll just cross that out right there it's, it's my scale I can do that because the because it becomes important although locally available it's not it, uh, candlefish don't occur or hooligan don't occur in all parts particularly the very inland parts of Denina territory uh, they were taken with dip nets also a very sort of interesting way of of ice fishing um, reverse ice fishing I call it. I need a place to draw here. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw it here. It would occur where there's a an ice shelf that's sticking out into the inlet and so here's the so this is the land, this is where you can stand and this is the bottom of the shore, a bottom of the of the inlet. And this is an ice shelf here. And with the tides coming in, so with a flood tide coming in this way they would cut a hole in the ice here and these little fish would be forced up through the hole along with the water and out again and the people just simply pick them up. Um, an illustration, I think, of minimizing effort to maximizing for maximizing return. I call that reverse ice fishing and that would happen mainly in the spring. Herring were important, particularly in Kachemak Bay 
Uh, it's not reported the name. Uh, the herring were fished out and are now extinct in Kachemak Bay. were fished out in the 1930s by commercial herring operations. And that's a tragic story, uh, a very tragic story that we should have uh, fished out an entire species. It got to the point where there were too few and they did not return. And as far as I know now, there only are sporadic herring in Kachemak Bay and there are to my knowledge, no attempts to bring that species back. Trout, Ustlagi, three important, but certainly don't occur in the volume of the of the salmon, uh, but important particularly in winter for that fresh fish. Um, but before the ice went out, drag nets, just taking a net, a person at either end, and dragging it through the water, taking them on shore. Um, would have been practiced. Again, minimizing effort, maximizing return. Dolly Varden were important, probably the same drag nets, same thing with rainbow trout. Um, uh, fresh fish in the winter also. Tom cod, uh, ice fishing, and used an interesting sort of thing. They take a piece of caribou on the end of, uh, on the end of um, uh, a line and dangle it and the tomcod grab onto that caribou skin and don't let go and you pull them out. They also were said to be harpooned, although they seem to be pretty small to be harpooned. Flounder were important, uh, two, level two, not very important. Octopus, amagook, that's a, it's either an alutig or a yupik word, amagook. Uh, just collect them, you know, that'd be Kachemak Bay. Freshwater sculpin were apparently eaten. Uh, there um, not a lot of meat on a freshwater sculpin, but they were. Same thing with a stickleback, but stickleback too stay over the winter and uh, would be uh, some to some degree a nutritional fish. I didn't know that uh, stickleback were even fished um, until just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were doing some interviews in Tyonic and they talked about uh, taking stickleback in the winter. So going back to halibut, this is how halibut were taken. Uh, so this is a shoreline and here's a big rock and you'd sink a pole in the ground here and dangle from a line a bait, the bait. So here's the bait and you do this when the tide is low and the bait would be about the height where a halibut would come along. And so the halibut comes along, grabs the bait, is, is, is hooked, is trapped, uh, can't get away because of the, to this line is tied to a log. Uh, tide goes back down again, and you go down and pick up your halibut. Minimized effort, maximized return. Now this wouldn't occur everywhere in Cook Inlet because the nature, the slope of the shoreline is apparently critical. And so halibut fishers today know about that and they know where the halibut are, or at least uh, were, uh, in terms of the near shoreline. So um, it wouldn't, uh, as I say, it wouldn't occur everywhere, but it would occur in certain places. And where it did occur, it'd be very important because of the size of halibut and the amount of return you get for very minimal effort. Uh, a typical question I might ask you in a test would be, give illustrations of minimized effort for maximized return. This would be one you could use. Shellfish then are important locally. Uh, it depends on where, it's very specific. Uh, mussels are very important. Uh, you just got to pick them. They're the easiest thing uh, and they have great volume. So I've got them listed three to five here, but uh, mussels don't occur everywhere. So mussels are, are mostly restricted to beds uh, further toward Kachemak Bay and in Kachemak Bay itself. Uh, clams, same thing, are locally available um, here near where I live. Clam Gulch, just south of me, is a popular razor clam uh, spot, and there's in great abundance. Uh, other places, butter clams, redneck clams, are are important. So I've got them listed as a three because they would be an important uh, spring resource. 
uh, various types of of uh, taking of clams, just pick them. Some of them you just pick them out or rake them out. Clam pinning is sort of an interesting technique. Um, it was if this is the if this is the 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 tide goes out and this is the sand, and here's your clam down here, and there's that little line that goes down, and there's a dimple on the top, right? So some of you have gone clam digging. And you know the way we do it now is you find that little dimple and you dig like crazy beside it and you reach in and there's your clam if you're good at digging. That assumes you've got a clam shovel. So what you do with clam pinning is you have a stick with the tip about the width of say a pencil like those old yellow number two pencils. Um, or maybe a little thinner. You can cut it from anything, willow, birch, something like that. It's got to be supple enough to bend a little bit, but not so supple that it bends over on itself. A couple feet long, three, two, three feet long. And you run that down in to, through that line, and it goes into the clam. I forget which end is up. I think the siphon is up and the foot is down. Uh, but anyway, it goes right through the clam and immobilizes it so it can't move. As you know, they rascals can move pretty fast. And uh, if you're digging and digging poorly, they'll be, they'll, they'll be gone before you get down there. But this immobilizes them so you can dig out easily without any difficulty. And there is your clam. Great for kids, by the way, for those of you who have little kids and go to Clam Gulch or some, some similar place, they can pin clams. A couple of years ago, a guy was taking this class from me, and I described this, and he didn't, didn't believe me, so he went down and did it, and sure enough, it worked, and he was so impressed, he commercialized these sticks. He, uh, he he used brazing rod from welding brazing rod and put a handle on it and sold them for ten dollars but <laughs> I'm afraid he didn't make much money because it's a whole lot easier with a cut your stick and go down and do it uh, it didn't cost you ten bucks shrimp one to two only in Catchmack Bay and not a lot of meat on a shrimp cockles uh, two so, shellfish were important, regionally important. So, marine mammals then, uh, uh, important again in certain areas. Uh, harbor seal I've got listed as three to five. Uh, most places not so important, but very locally very important. South end of Calgon Island, for example, was a very important area for harbor seals. Some places in Kachemak Bay very important for harbor seals. Uh, sometimes seals will go up rivers and uh, there they can be taken by um, blocking their path back to the uh, back to the ocean. Same with beluga and porpoise but we'll get to that. So if you do get them, five is very important but uh, also they're, uh, they're, they're elusive. How were they taken? One was swim stocking. You went out, you're in the water, they're on shore, and you sort of, you sort of make movements like a seal, and uh, then you go on board and club them. Also, badarka and bow and arrow with a harpoon arrow. Osgood describes a harpoon arrow on page 88. And perhaps from a badarka with a harpoon, although that's a more uh, alutic style, and, and I think that was probably done, but not doesn't seem to be as done as much. Porpoise I've listed as a three just because porpoises don't seem to go out um, onto beaches. Um, but again, lots of nutrition, lots of lots of uh, food energy if you can get one. Beluga I've got four to five. Gunshi. Uh, so this was a very uh, uh, interesting technique that occurred only among the Denina as far as taking beluga. And as you know, beluga are a resident population in Cook Inlet. And this 
uh, technique was dependent on the straight shoreline of Cook Inlet. And so we're going to make a shoreline here. Here's the shore, and the land is over here. And uh, a tree would be felled, a large tree uh, sticking out at right angles to the inlet. And uh, at high tide then, a man would be stationed out here on the end with a harpoon and the other end of the line tied off onto this tree. So here comes the beluga and as it's swimming it is diverted out by this tree to go around past the guy. He harpoons it and because this stout line, probably a line maybe ironically actually made from the height of a beluga, uh, holds on to it, can't get away. And so at uh, when tide goes out and at low tide uh, the people go out and butcher their beluga and there you have it. Again, a minimizing effort, maximizing return, but a very unique way of taking beluga uh, and uh, dependent on the very unique environment of Cook Inlet with the high tides and the relatively straight shoreline. Here are the straight shoreline used to their advantage. Uh, in most cases the taking of marine mammals is done in bays and inlets where the where the marine mammals go in to feed. Gunchi. Sea otter were important. Sea otter, it's debatable how extensive sea otter were in Cook Inlet. Uh, the Russians came in and organized some very large sea otter hunts, but uh, they were not sustainable. And sea otter were taken primarily for their skin. The hide, as you know, is very luxuriant. The beluga, the porpoise, the harbor seal, they insulate by fat layers as mammals, but the sea otter insulate with their fur. And the fur has some of the highest densities of hair follicles per square centimeter as any other animal and so that becomes the uh, insulating layer but also from a human standpoint a very um, excellent um, uh, fur for robes and other types of things. Sea otter were taken by Badarka and Harpoon um, and uh, and as far as I know were not eaten. Uh, there's some suggestion that there may have been taboos against eating sea otter uh, because of their human-like qualities but uh, I don't think that's been worked out yet. Sea lions, the outer Kenai Peninsula were taken for their skin and we described the rope, that single cut of rope from sea lion that would have been important and likely taken by Badarka and Harpoon. Here's a harpoon, Denina style harpoon that Osgood illustrates. It's a standard harpoon, uh, almost certainly the idea borrowed from the Alutic. So this is the detachable head here. And this line uh, here, it's connected to the foreshaft. So that's the foreshaft right there. And as you stab the animal, the the harpoon goes in, it toggles so it can't come out. The float is thrown overboard. The animal dives, dragging the float in the water. If you recall Archimedes' principle, that float uh, filled with air will weigh the equivalent of the water it displaces. So in other words, if you were to fill that float with water and hold it up and weigh it, that's how much it would be weigh, weighing, dragging through the water. And uh, eventually the mammal tires out, has to breathe, and you paddle over and now it's dragging two balloons through the water or floats and eventually tires out and you dispatch it. Another illustration of minimizing effort to maximizing return uh, for uh, sea mammal hunting. Land mammals then, uh, uh, very important in no particular order. Uh, caribou, bejoch, caribou, four to five, occurs as far as I know throughout Denina territory. So both the fr both the meat, yeah, that's the four to five, and the hide was important. 
and when we described technology we described a lot of pieces of clothing that were made from caribou hides. Dogs were used to hunt caribou. Um, bow and arrow was used. We'll show you bow and arrows in a moment. It was also uh, described that Denina could run down a caribou uh, and you would have to of course be very fit and you would knife it in the back of the neck and uh, Pete Bobby is one who was seen running down caribou, uh, a man who died in his 90s a couple of years ago, and run along, jump on back on the back, and uh, that way in historic times he didn't have to utilize any shells, but also a very, um, very important survival technique. They may have used uh, caribou fences. Uh, caribou fences are described further north a fence is not a fence, but more a set of poles that sort of move out from a V and the caribou herd comes in and they tend to shy away from the poles moving into a box canyon or uh, maybe a fenced in area from which they're dispatched. Um, but um, I don't think anyone's ever found the fence and, and the uh, nature of the caribou on the Kenai Peninsula and possibly in the Susitna area was not the large, large herd animals as you would find them in the Mulchatna herd area over on the other side of Denina territory. More um, sort of um, forest caribou, small groups. But in the Mulchatna herd, uh, very likely caribou fences were used, but I don't think anyone has ever found them. Four to five for caribou and the hides important. Same with the moose. So Nigi. Um, many Denina stories talk about seeing the first moose around 1900. Uh, we know that the caribou were becoming extinct. The last sighted caribou was reported in 1917 and so at the early part of the uh, 20th century the caribou were becoming extinct and the habitat was becoming more conducive to moose and this is likely due to an extensive set of fires some of which are natural fires that were triggered by uh, probably lightning but uh, as a consequence of uh, spruce bark beetle infestation and some were artificially set by miners particularly clearing land for mining that uh, cleared large areas and so what grew back was Browse was willow and birch that were um, conducive to moose habitat. So many Denina talk about moose moving in uh, in the in around 1900, and the caribou then disappearing. So biologists uh, disputed that. Uh, so that remains to be worked out. Um, but I tend to think that uh, moose it, were not very pr prevalent and the Denina were right moved in or at least became more prevalent in the 1800s, late, uh, 19, early 1900s. And they were taken by bow and arrow. Uh, I'll show you, I think I'm going to skip ahead and skip back if you don't mind me doing that. Uh, no, well, this must be a couple of slides ahead, so we'll come back to this one. We'll get to it eventually. Beaver are very important. Beaver are very common. Uh, four, maybe even a five, uh, the hide is it was used, the skin was used, uh, almost like, um, like sea otter. The skin is very luxuriant and, and very a uh, good insulator. Um, but the meat was also eaten. I've eaten beaver. It's very good. Uh, and so I've got it listed here as a four, not quite the five, but, but very important. And beaver were mostly snared uh, coming out of the, their um, winter, winter holes late winter. Rabbits and kaba, rabbit, uh, or hare technically. I've got it, I've said rabbit, but they're technically a hare. Um, four, again depending on the cycle. Uh, very important, very abundant, uh, perhaps not as nutritious uh, food as some of the other things, but very abundant. And the skins were very important. Rabbit skin, very, very good insulator. 
and rabbit snares were uh, were common and I will show you some Denina style rabbit snares in a moment. Uh, two types of bear as you know Kaga the brown bear and Elt Eshi the black bear uh, both important uh, not as important because they're carnivores or they're omnivores technically but not uh, not as abundant as caribou moose so I've got them listed here as a three and of course the skin of the bear was important bears also figure prominently in mythology in stories as a symbol of power of nature um, they were taken uh, when a man uh, found a bear den he would go back and announce it to the village and that became his bear and one way to take it was uh, simply building a fire and directing the smoke in and asphyxiating the bear in the den um, again an, an illustration of minimizing effort to maximizing return but uh, uh, but uh, another type uh, was to spirit and I may have told the story I don't know that same Pete Bobby showed his daughter Helen how to spear a bear and he uh, used a spear she was 13 at the time so this would have been in the 1950s found the brown bear got it to rise up on its hind legs and speared it in the neck driving the spear up into the, the base of the skull and uh, Helen was told this I heard heard the story from Helen I'm sure she's told it to many others as well and she said I was scared <laughs> I don't blame you Helen I was might be scared too I get scared just thinking about it um, so it was you know this this took a lot of courage to to spear a bear um, Pete Bobby by the way did this because of a denied a prophecy that prophecy is that this world is unsustainable and that uh, someday people will need to know the old techniques of living off the land didn't want that to happen didn't didn't um, didn't do anything to encourage that to happen but just the observation that uh, we are in an unsustainable world and Helen would pass that on to her children would pass that on as a way to live off the land Bears were also taken by pitfalls, particularly near the storage pits, the underground cold storage pits filled with salmon. So pitfalls were a very deep pit uh, covered over with, uh, I don't know, thin logs and so on. And then with spikes put into the, um, put into the ground, vertically sharpened spikes, probably spruce or birch and so when the bear slips in falls in it impales itself to try to protect the salmon source and I'll show you a picture of a bear snare here in a moment sheep nuji are taken sheep um, are two their meat is probably not particularly significant the skin would be significant and other things like the horn for uh, making s uh, spoons and other types of items dogs were used in taking sheep probably dogs were used in taking bear too I might add and bow and arrow porcupine uh, ganshi uh, I've got listed here as a three but it may easily be a four uh, porcupine were survival food so normally people did not kill a porcupine even though they came upon one leave it for a time when there might be a hunter or somebody else out in the woods who was having trouble because along with spruce hens which will come to in a moment the porcupine are the easiest game to take and so it became a kind of survival food um, in addition to the food the grease was very important the grease was a, um, a waterproofing or water resisting agent that was spread on boots and other things and the quills as we talked about in the technology discussion the quills were very significant as far as uh, decorating uh, garments go so porcupine I'm gonna just change that. I'm gonna make that a four hard to draw with a mouse we'll make that a four and they're taken with a bow and arrow or simply clubbed 
Goats as by uh, mountain goat two. The horn again was important. The hide was important. Uh, but that's a lot of work to get a goat, and there's not a lot of them, so that reduces their their scale number. And taken with dogs and bow and arrows. Uh, then a lot of fur bearers. So the fur bearers uh, all were taken with either snares or deadfalls, and I'll show you a deadfall or blunt arrows. A blunt arrow was uh, an arrow, uh, an arrow, but not a sharpened arrow point, a blunt point that would stun it, and then it would be probably clubbed or something else. So uh, I haven't got a number here because they normally were not eaten. Um, the food was um, possibly used for dogs, uh, but um, Osgood mentions that they were not eaten. Uh, although I find that curious in terms of squirrel, because squirrel is very edible. Um, but some of the others, like uh, land otters, <laughs> smell terribly. Uh, they're uh, not considered edible. Um, so I'll just you know leave that for now. Osgood mentions they weren't eaten, so we'll say they weren't eaten. So marmots, muskrat, lynx, ermine, mink, fox, marten, squirrel, and land otter were all taken primarily for their skin, for their hides. Skins wear out, so you would be continually replacing them uh, by uh, creating, by getting new, new furs, new skins, tanning them, and making new garments. And there's a few others. Wolverine uh, Idashla. Idashla means little friend, and that isn't meant literally as a little friend. It's sort of a euphemism because wolverines were disliked. Wolverines would break into caches. Wolverines would partly eat uh, a moose kill, for example, or a caribou kill, and urinate on it and make it largely unedible for anything else. Uh, wolverine fur, however, is is excellent, as we know. That's the good rough for, for a parka. So the fur would have been used, but also uh, protection, just to keep them away from the village, because wolverines uh, are a threat. Bow and arrows and deadfalls. Wolves, too, would be perceived to be a threat. Uh, the fur would be used, but it was said that wolves would be um, uh, hunted out from around a village as protection from uh, for children playing and, and other sorts of things like that. Birds, then. Um, birds are variable. Of course, uh, in the spring, the birds coming back are very important, and the eggs would be very important. So ducks and geese would be those two uh, important uh, spring birds, listed them here as a three. Uh, they were taken with various ways. Uh, one of the snares were common, but also with a slingshot. So the Denina slingshot is a long, um, long sort of uh, cord, uh, not cord, kind of a thong, which would be about an inch wide. Uh, maybe, how long would that be? About six feet long, maybe? And uh, depending on how tall you were, and you would double it over and you'd hold it between your uh, first finger and your middle finger, and the other end between the middle finger and the little and the ring finger. So, uh, and you put a rock in the where it doubles on itself, and you th spin it like a slingshot over your head, and you let go with one of the fingers. Uh, I would uh, do it between my middle finger and my ring finger and away the rock flies. And it's surprising how accurate you can be with this. Uh, at a distance of 20 yards, it it's, doesn't take too long to be accurate within two, three feet. And I'm sure with a lot of practice, you could be very, very accurate, very deadly with these as far as ducks and geese go. So that slingshot, I don't know the distribution of it. Uh, all I know is that's what the Denina used. Uh, spruce hens or spruce grouse uh, were also that emergency food talked about. Uh, they were taken with a deadfall or clubbed if you could, you know, 
They're the ones that uh, flutter up away from you in the woods and scare you half to death. Um, but weren't taken normally except as emergency food and are very nutritious, very edible. And by the way, the feathers are very beautiful. Swans were eaten, again with this taken with the slingshot, possibly snared. Um, but uh, a lot of effort to get a swan. Same with loons. Um, ptarmigan probably um, more important, probably a three, maybe even more than a three, snared in the winter and providing fresh food in the winter. Gulls were eaten. We don't eat gulls today, but gulls were eaten. Uh, not important, not highly important, but uh, they were snared. Eagles were taken not for food, but for the talons, and talons and the feathers. And uh, owls uh, also relatively unimportant. Uh, there's, they're a big bird, but there's not a lot of meat on an owl. So this is what I had forwarded to before, but it's way down the line here. So here we are with how to track a moose. And uh, you might say to yourself, well, why do I need to track a moose? They're kind of just always standing right there. Uh, and I got some insight into that when I was out in the Mulchatna area, which is a relatively wild area. And I'm used to moose being uh, used to me. And uh, sometimes, you know, to my to our detriment, but uh, it's pretty easy to get close to a moose uh, in the urban areas. But out there, it, you would they'd be a quarter mile away and they'd bolt if they saw you. So uh, a lot more skittish, a lot more um, uh, a lot more uh, running from humans. So so you would have to track them uh, to find them. So. The circles here are the moose trail. So here's the moose moving along and it's looking for a place to bed down. And so you're coming, this is the human coming and comes across a moose trail and you don't turn and follow it because it'll get, it'll, it'll know, know that. What you do is you make a big circle like this and then you come back and see if you've got the trail. Yes. So the moose, meanwhile, keeps going and circles around into the wind to um, bed down. So you keep your pattern up. Oh yeah, there it is. Until you come across and whoop, no moose. Where is it? Must have bed down. So you do this to look for where it's bed down. Oh, there's the tracks. Now I know where it is. So that puts you right there, at which case you can dispatch the bedded down moose. Again, attempting to minimize effort to maximize return. These are some of the snares. Um, this is a rabbit snare here. Uh, this would be a snare for a moose. You would hang that from a tree or dangle it somehow to catch a moose. Uh, this is for birds. This particular one is for birds. This is for rabbits also. Um, not sure what this is meant to a damned animal. Maybe a bear. I guess you could do that with a bear. Um, but snares are um, are very important and the, like most northern peoples the Denina had an amazing array, array of snares. And deadfalls. So here are deadfalls and both snares and deadfalls would be used primarily with fur bearing animals because that way you don't puncture a hole in them and the fur is still good. All of these or most of these are triggered with a figure four trap. Here's a figure four trap here, here's a figure four trap here, here's one here, and here's an inset of what a figure four trap looks like. Figure four trap was not unique to the Denina. It was widely used over, really over North America. And I don't know its origin, where it occurred, but um, it had a, uh, this trigger mechanism, the bait would be put out here. And if you build this right, you just, just a slight touch on it will initiate, in this case, a log falling. Uh, same thing here, logs falling or this sort of platform-like thing falling. And uh, 
I'm going to stop there my talk here and at this point I'm going to inset a short little video that illustrates uh, the use of a deadfall trap. So the poor little she-wolf was trapped and I should add that the string was uh, because we didn't want to stick our hands in there and trigger the, the mechanism but the string would not be part of that. So very effective, uh, very, uh, very um, minimizing effort, maximizing return. The Danina have a number of stories that uh, are a genre of stories called stupid boy stories. And one of the stupid boy stories uh, involves a deadfall trap such as you saw illustrated. And that was a scale model, by the way, the, the deadfalls would be, you know, I don't know what that, four feet across or something like that. Um, by, depending on the animal you were gonna, you were gonna trap, something like that. Um, so this, this stupid boy story, I'll tell you the short version of it. Uh, so there's a boy, uh, and uh, he asks his aunt uh, if he could go check the deadfall trap. And she says, sure, go, yeah, go ahead. And then he asks, if there's nothing in it, what should I do? Well, that's a stupid question, correct? If there's nothing in it, you just leave it and go back later to check it. But she tells him, well, you just grab the bait. Okay. Stupid boy goes to the deadfall trap. He sees there's nothing in it. He crawls in. He grabs the bait. Later, his aunt and uncle can't find him. They go out and they look. And sure enough, his feet are sticking out from the deadfall trap. Well, these are pretty grim stories. They're, uh, we, we want our stories, our children's stories anyway, to, to have a good ending. Uh, and uh, someone comes and saves the day, sort of Lone Ranger type stories. But uh, the Nina stories don't have that good ending. Uh, at least the stupid boy stories don't have that good ending. And by the way, there is one stupid girl story, just to be fair. Um, and these stories are meant, I think, to be, uh, to be educational. Don't be stupid, is what they're saying. We need you to be smart. We need you to learn your lessons. We need you to be observant. We need you to learn to make good judgments. Don't be stupid. Same lesson today. Same lesson we need from young people today. There's lots of problems in this world. We need you to learn your lessons. We need you to help solve the problems that face us today. Don't be stupid. Learn your lessons. We need you. So bows and arrows. Uh, bows are really hard to photograph. This is a photograph in the Peabody Museum in y at Yale University. Uh, this is a close-up of Osgood's description of uh, various types of bows. One was a sinew-backed bow and A and B. These two are illustrating sinew-backed bows. So this is sinew, the back strap uh, or the of the moose or whatever animal anyway or the or the ligament from the tendons in the legs. And so those ligaments would go the whole length of the of the um of the bow. So as you pull the bow string here, you pull this bow string so the I don't know if this is a back bow or not. I can't tell from the photo, but if it were, the backing would go all this way. And this would be sinew as well. I'm not doing this all that great, but you, so you're pulling sinew against sinew. The wood is just there to sort of hold it. And this is ver these are very powerful bows. They would be used at short range. They would be used, say, for a bear or a moose or something like that at short range. Very powerful, but not so good for long range. So uh, the unbacked bow, possibly number uh, letter C here, 
would be used for longer range shooting but not so powerful so you gotta have one or the other you can have a powerful bow not good for distance or you can have a distance bow not good not with a lot of power uh, so you would have your bow according to uh, what you're going to use it for quivers of course quivers were highly decorated and the the uh, various types of arrows so bows and arrows critical uh, to know how to make and to know how to use here's another quiver this is a um, photo of one uh, from the P Peabody Museum. The upper right is a uh, harpoon and this is a copper that would be a bear, bear spear point. Uh, they don't have a scale on this but this is likely about six eight inches uh, from here to here and this would be the haft where it would be uh, hafted onto a handle and that would be the type of spear that you would use to kill a bear and uh, for other general purposes it was said that all men carried a bear spear at all times so this would be the general men's tool that uh, that they would have um, in their possession at all times so uh, plants let's talk about plants um, uh, this uh, this uh, is Osgood's list of plants. Priscilla Russell Carey, whose book I'll show you in a moment, uh, uh, identifies over 80 uh, edible and medicinal plants in Dena'ina territory. So the list is much bigger than this, much longer than this, uh, and uh, uh, very important. I've got them all listed: three to five, three to four except maybe down here with the uh, spruce fiber and so on. But uh, very important, adding to the diet, uh, rounding out the diet. So Pushki, that's that cow parsnip. Uh, that, by the way, has, uh, for some people, with bright when there's bright sun, the out, by brushing against the outside can be toxic. So don't be messing around with Pushki and trying to eat it unless you really know what you're doing. Geis is what the Denina call it. Geis, and very abundant, very important, and fairly nutritious. Various types of seaweeds in Catchmack Bay, same thing. This sort of a lump all category seaweeds. Rose hips are important. Wild peas, wild onions, wild potato, all important. Wild potato, more interior, uh, also thought to be a survival food. Um, uh, salmon berry, various types of berries, very significant, very important. As we know, you probably collect berries yourself. Blueberries, raspberries, high bush cranberries, low bush cranberries, hay gecka. Hay means winter, winter berries. So you can occasionally find low bush cranberries where the snow isn't too, isn't uh, too covering too much. Um, they're still good. Even high bush cranberries. I come across those as I'm skiing. I'll eat them. So uh, all of these were very, very significant. And uh, uh, others were important for medicinal reasons, and we'll talk about that at another lecture. Bark, uh, spruce bark as fiber and birch bark as fiber were spring survival food. If times were tough, you could eat bark, especially once the once the um, once the sap sap starts flowing, uh, gives you some nutritional value. Birch syrup was made, and two to three uh, as a source of sugar. Ferns, oh, ferns were important, uh, particularly in the spring. Later on, they get pretty bitter. So uh, can't underestimate the importance of the gathered plants for the Denina diet. That uh, mo the best information is from uh, Priscilla Russell Carey's uh, Denina or Tenina plant lore, Denina et una, uh, an ethnobotany of the Denina of South Central Alaska. And if uh, if you ever see this book for sale, I would highly recommend getting it. 
page by page it describes the plant it describes how it was processed how it was used uh, and uh, its uh, its importance so note that it's not meant to be a guide to edible plants to wild edible plants it's an ethnobotany and there's a difference it's describing how the people used it in in many cases there would be additional information that would be very important uh, in order to know how to how to reduce toxicity for example or what time of year it needs to be collected and other types of things so I just want to urge you uh, not to just strike out on your own but to um, but to find someone who's knowledgeable do your research if you're interested in wild uh, plants for food or wild plants for medicine. Uh, this is a remarkable book. It's, uh, it's got a wealth of information and she interviewed uh, elders. Many of these elders who are pictured here on the front cover are no longer with us uh, and so this information becomes lost as uh, the elders die out. So we uh, owe a great debt to Priscilla for doing this work. Uh, I want to end this with uh, talking about Into the Wild, Chris McCandless. Um, so many of you know the story of Chris McCandless uh, as portrayed in the book Into the Wild, uh, from which a motion picture Into the Wild was made. And uh, this is from the motion picture. This is an actual picture of Chris McCandless, self-taken picture at the bus. Uh, so the story goes, uh, he was a graduate uh, with a degree in anthropology, by the way, of Emory University. He was from suburban Washington, D.C., grew up in that suburban atmosphere. And after graduation from college, uh, family expectations were that he would go off and um, find productive work. But he didn't. He left his girlfriend, as portrayed here in the movie, uh, and off he went on a vision quest, or what we, he, what we would today call a vision quest. And he traveled uh, many places, I can't remember them all, Mexico, California, eventually finding his way to Alaska. And uh, set about to live off the land for a year. He bought a book, <coughs> excuse me, he bought a book at the, in Fairbanks, at the uh, bookstore at the university. And the very book he bought was Priscilla Russell's Denina uh, ethnobotany book, the book we just showed, and uh, hitchhiked down to north of Denali uh, National Park and hiked in to an area. He crossed a couple of rivers and he hiked in to this bus. And it's not that far in. I can't remember how far it's in, but it's, I don't know, 50, 60 miles in or so. And he decided that was where, he, as far as he was going to go, and he stayed. And he commenced to live off the land. I believe he had a 22 rifle or something like that. And he had her book, and he was gathering plants and uh, and uh, living off the land. He uh, he died. Um, he starved to death at the bus. Uh, tragically, uh, his journal his, his uh, documents it and that story became the subject of John Krakauer's excellent book on the lower pictured in the lower right called Into the Wild and <clears throat> Chris McCandless has become something of a cult figure particularly in Eastern colleges if you google him or Into the Wild you will see many a course uh, that uh, delves into his life and his book, or his work, his, uh, the story of him. Including, by the way, an article that I wrote about him. In Alaska, he's controversial. Um, uh, uh, some people think he was nuts for doing this. 
Uh, I don't. I understand what he was doing. Uh, when you go on a vision quest, you have to test yourself. Um, but uh, he also uh, um, made two errors, I would say. Uh, error number one is that uh, living off the land is not an individual activity. Living on the land is about community. It's about being part of a group. It's about sharing resources. It's about sharing activities. It's about reinforcing one another. I had a student a number of years ago who came to class and very much in the Chris McCandless mindset. He wanted to learn about living off the land. He wanted to go out and live by himself. He rejected his um, uh, his roots, and he and and he was angry. He was angry in class because I wasn't teaching that sort of thing. I was, you know, he wanted to know how you made a bow so you could go, so you could go kill a moose. He wanted to know how to make a trap, how to make a snare. And as we've just covered, I covered some of that, but that wasn't the focus of it. And when we got to the section. Uh, in Cook Inlet Anthropology of about social organization. Uh, I don't remember exactly what I was talking about at that time, but I remember looking at him, and it was a class of 15 or so at the time, and it was like a, like the bell went off in his mind, like, like all of a sudden the lights came on and it, his countenance changed. And he came up after class and he talked to me about it, and he said, oh, it's about community. It's not about being an individual. It's about being a community. And that's what the meaning of life is. And while he still pursued that understanding, he, um, he gave up the, the chance to, or the, the goal to go out and live by himself. And that's what McCandless did. He he gave up community. He gave up his girlfriend, pictured in the lower left, at least in the movie version of it. He gave up his family and uh, tried to strike out on himself, by himself. Uh, he also, a second lesson to be learned from Mr. McCandless, he had the wrong book. He had Priscilla Russell's Denina Ethnobotany. But he was not in Denina territory. He was north of the of Denina territory in a different ecosystem, with plants ripening at different times, with toxicity occurring in different ways according to different soil conditions. And many think it's because of eating a, um, a toxic plant, a plant that had been edible earlier in the spring, but as the summer wore on, became toxic and he poisoned himself to death. We may never know exactly, but that's likely something like that happened. Um, at the end of the book, Into the Wild, John Krakauer writes very movingly about going into the bus. A helicopter in with his parents and, uh, and Krakauer himself and the father very movingly uh, uh, puts a plaque in memory of his son on the bus and they gather wildflowers as a kind of bouquet um, for the memory of the of Chris McCandless and um, Krakauer lists those flowers fireweed uh, wild geranium, monkshood. And when I got to the part about monkshood, a chill went down my spine. Monkshood is one of the most toxic poisons, poisonous plants in Alaska. If you have a cut and uh, whatever it's called, juice from the monkshood that you picked gets into that cut, uh, some say you have seven minutes, depending on your size and other things. It's very toxic. It's the poison that a Lutig 
used on their harpoons to kill whales, aconitum poisoning, monkshood. Very, very toxic. So how ironic and potentially tragic that Krakauer and the parents themselves might have died in a sense for the same reason that McCandless did. Not understanding the territory, not understanding the land, not understanding the plants, not having that cultural wisdom that comes from generations of living off the land and uh, moving into a territory you don't know. So um, that's a that's a lesson, I think, for us all. What we're trying to understand here is how a culture lived in a territory and developed cultural wisdom and cultural knowledge to become not to not just survive but to become sustainable. And uh, in its tragic way, um, I thank Chris McCandless for helping teach us that lesson and uh, and for that for that story. Thank you.